Hi everyone and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online for Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of Holy Week. We've been looking forward to this and preparing our hearts during Lent and we're excited about celebrating all that Jesus did for us during this week. And we'll start Easter weekend with our Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. This will be a specially focused worship service on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and we encourage you to make plans to be with us for this important service. And Saturday morning, we're going to have our Easter egg hunt for children up through fifth grade. It's going to be at 10 o'clock. There are going to be games and crafts as well as an egg hunt. Uh, so make sure you invite your friends to bring their kids and join us for this fun family event. And of course, Easter Sunday, we'll have Bible school at 9 o'clock, as we usually do, and a very special Easter service at 10. This is a great time to invite your neighbors, your friends, your family who don't have a church home to come and worship with us as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And of course, our Lent devotions will continue to be available through Saturday, April 16th. And I hope you'll use those as you have your quiet time with God each day. I also want to let you know about a special project. Remember the children, one of our mission points that, we're, uh, uh, that we support here uh, we're going to be taking up a special offering on the 24th to support the relief efforts they're coordinating as they help the tens of thousands of refugees of the war in Ukraine. They've been sending in trucks filled with food, bringing them back filled with refugees to safety, feeding them, giving them temporary lodging and whatever else they can do. And of course, this isn't something they budgeted for, so we encourage you to pray about that. I know a lot of you have already given online, and that's great. If you don't do online giving and you would like to help support Remember the Children's Efforts, you can send a check to the church, clearly mark it for Ukraine, and we'll include that with our gift. But this is such a huge need. One of the folks who's been working with them uh, actually was killed going into Ukraine to deliver supplies. We sometimes use the term being on the front lines euphemistically, but these folks are going into a war zone to help people who desperately need help. And we want to support their efforts as much as we possibly can. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, we're so blessed to be living in a country that has freedom and peace. And we're reminded each day that there are so many who don't have that. So we want to give you thanks. And we lift up those in Ukraine and Romania who are in the direct path of the fighting. Those who are sacrificing so much and risking so much to help. We pray for strength, for protection, and a peaceful resolution. And we pray that through the efforts of your people, your love would be demonstrated in a way that would build your kingdom, that more people would be drawn to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. As we said, today is Palm Sunday, the day Jesus was welcomed to Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna. How quickly things would change. And after time of worship, through song, Lindsay will have our message, Journey to Jerusalem.
Find it with me in your Bibles, if you would, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, Palm Sunday, a journey toward Jerusalem. And as you find Matthew 21, I want to give you a little context about uh, Palm Sunday and where we are as we approach Easter, because Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He is entering for what will be his last time in his earthly ministry ever to move into and go into and enter into his holy city, his beloved city. This is a very special moment. Not many people spend time on Palm Sunday scriptures, but I'm here to tell you that that there are uh, 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 emotions uh, abundant in this uh, section of text. Let me give you an illustration. I have found that in my years on this earth, my living years, I have found that there are generally two types of people. Two types of people. <laughs> there are roller coaster people and non roller coaster people. I am a non roller coaster person. <laughs> now, if you're a roller coaster person, you know what I'm talking about. You might say, why in the world is he talking about roller coasters on a Sunday morning? Because Palm Sunday is filled with emotions and it's like a roller coaster ride. I'm a non-roller coaster person. You want to know why? I can do well with the sideways turns and twists. But you know what gets me? Click, click, (laughs) click. You know where that's going, don't you? I got chills just giving you that illustration. I tried before, people. I have tried. I've tried to be like you if you're a roller coaster person. It's not in me. Because every time I get in that seat and they buckle me down and they say, hands and feet inside the ride, and the last thing they say as you're going away, they say, please enjoy your ride. I'm not going to enjoy this. I'm not going to enjoy it because of the click, click, click. It's taking me to the top. You know what happens at the top, don't you? You drop. That's right. And you know what I have noticed? That when that thing starts to click, 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 and it doesn't do it at first. It kind of just goes, goes for a short distance, and you feel pretty good for the short distance, and then you go like this. As soon as you hear that first click, you realize, I'm done for. <laughs> I can't get out of this thing. And you get to the top, and then it's all she wrote as you go down. I can't stand. There's terror in that for me. As I read down through this scripture, you may not know it just to read the words here, but there are roller coaster emotions that abound in this section. And I want to pull out and let you see along with me. Okay? I'm going to read it in its entirety. Verses 1 through 11. Every single one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have an account of Palm Sunday and share a little bit different information than one another. But let me just read on down through this, and then we will go back and we'll catch up, and we'll find the emotions. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? What a great question. 
You better mark that one. We're coming back to it a little bit. Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, normally, I will go back up to the top of the scripture section, and I'll move on down through it. But this is not a normal day for us. I want to camp out on verses 10 and 11 as we begin. And I want you to understand and see with me, as we look again at verse 10 specifically, that his entry always makes an impact. You realize that? The entry of Jesus, anywhere he went, everywhere he goes, always makes an impact. See again verse 10 with me. Now it's tucked away in here, but I don't want you to miss it. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, watch, the whole city was what? Stirred. Stirred. That's an interesting word. It means to agitate. The whole city of Jerusalem. It means to agitate. It means to shake something up. It means to move something to another space. Think about that soda can when you were a child and your brother or sister wanted the soda can and they didn't know that you had shook it up prior to. He said, here, yeah, have a Coke. (laughs) And as soon as they opened it, as you stood way back in the back and watched, it went everywhere. That's the kind of expression we see right here. When Jesus enters anywhere, he causes a stir. Don't you love that? If you think back with me, you don't have to turn there, but if you think back with me to Matthew chapter 2, the birth of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus, you have the Magi. They came from the east. And they came and said, where is this one who was born, what? King of the Jews. You know what it says in verse 3? King Herod heard this, and he was disturbed. And then right after that, in verse 3, it says, and all of Jerusalem with him. (laughs) See, when Jesus arrives anywhere, when he enters anywhere, things get disturbed. People get troubled. Things get stirred. People get moved. Have you ever felt that about you? I've been sitting right here in this auditorium, even as a little boy, 13 years old, and I was stirred by what was preached that day. I was sitting right back there, (laughs) actually, at at the back of this section right here. And the place was packed. 13 years old, the invitation hymn was sung. I didn't know what to do, but I knew I had to do something. My mom and dad didn't come that day. It was just me. I turned to a man. I wish I knew his name. To this day, I do not. But I turned to him, and I tugged on the sleeve of his coat, and I said, is this time to go forward? He looked down at me. He said, yeah, kid. (laughs) It's time. I made my way down this aisle because I was stirred. Has Jesus ever stirred, moved in you? Has scripture ever got underneath your skin? Wherever he enters, folks, I'm here to tell you, he always leaves an impact. Someone has said, God will meet you wherever you are. Guess what? He never leaves you where he finds you. Has this happened to you? I got a phone call one day. I got a phone call one day from a dad (laughs) of a teenage son This was after worship on a Sunday. And he said, Lindsay, I got a problem here. I said, what's your problem? He said, you got to talk to my teenage son. He was in church today. And he is convinced that I talked to you about a confidential conversation I had with him last week. I said, what's the deal? What's going on? I don't even know this young man. He said, Lindsay, what you preached on today was the very conversation he had with me confidentially, and he thinks I shared it with you. (laughs) I said, said, well, put him on the phone. And he said, Dad shared it with you, didn't he? I said, shared what? He said, you know what. I said, no, I don't know what. He said, you talked about it when you read Scripture today. I said, that wasn't me talking to you. It was the Lord speaking to your heart. And I say, I still don't know what it is. I said, I don't even want to know what you're going through. But God always knows. 
You see, when Jesus enters, everywhere he enters, his arrival, his entry in Jerusalem, the whole city was desert. And I pray one day that the city of Charlottesville will be stirred again with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because of what's going on right here in this church. And I mean that with all my heart. I truly mean that. The scripture movie. I did something, uh, it was about eight, maybe nine months or so ago. <laughs> I came up to my wife and said, honey, we got a great ministry over here at All Points. Got a wonderful ministry over here. God's doing great stuff. <laughs> but I, I said, I'm restless. And she said, uh-oh. I said, no, I'm restless. We have a great ministry. I love the people. They, they, they love us. But I'm restless. By the way, I've shared this with them. <laughs> they know this. I said, I'm restless. I think God wants more from us. And she said, Lindsay, why don't we do something? And that always brings problems when my wife says that. She said, why don't we pray that God would give us a challenge that would surprise us? And I said, okay, let's do it. What harm could it be? And I'm standing right here before you because of that prayer, I believe. We prayed it all through the fall. When Jesus enters, he always leaves an impact, okay? When you go out this week and you talk to someone in your family, in your home, your relatives, and say, you know what, something awesome is happening at Cherry Avenue, and it's called the resurrection being preached, come with me this next coming Sunday. Don't be surprised if God opens an opportunity, a door of opportunity there for you. Because that's what he does. It's true. Now, let's go back up to the top of our scripture, because I camped out long enough on what I wanted you to see there. By the way, we're going to come back to it at the end. Verses 1 and 2 and 3, see him with me. I want you to realize not only does his entry always leave an impact, but this entry into Jerusalem, this last time he would come into the city, is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is God's plan. God's plan. Notice this with me. It's going to take us through verses 4 and 5 as well, but I want you to see something. This has got to be the luckiest donkey ever created. Okay? As they came, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, hey, go to the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there. Check this donkey out. With her colt by her very specific. And then he says, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them. He will send them right away. Did you catch that? This is all very specific. This donkey was hand-picked, I believe, in advance by God. The owner evidently knew something about it, okay? Can you imagine? Luckiest donkey in the world. <laughs> really, you get, to, you get to be the one that brings in the Savior as he approaches the cross. Now, in the Gospel of Mark and over in Luke, when, it talks, when they talk about this Palm Sunday event, it talks about the donkey being one that has never ridden before. I think the King James says, uh, unbroken. <laughs> How would you like to get on a horse that's unbroken? <laughs> you know what? I love horses as long as it's in a picture. <laughs> Never been ridden before. Unbroken would carry the Christ to the cross. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. This is God's plan all along. He had it mapped out in advance. 500 years before, look at verse 5, 500 years before, Zechariah, the prophet, God is speaking here, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of a donkey. Tell me something, why a donkey? Why not a beautiful steed? Why not a stallion to take our king into Jerusalem? Huh? Why not a chariot? With all the bells and whistle, I'll tell you why. The donkey in the Bible is the beast of burden. A beast of burden. <laughs> and Jesus would be riding into town on a symbol of peace. He comes humbly, you see, humbly. Not as a conquering king, but as a 
crucified king. Not wearing a crown of jewels and power, but a crown of thorns and a crown of peace. And here's the life application I want you to make in your life with these verses today right here. I want you to see this for you. He never forces his way into our lives. You see, his entry is not by force, but it's by invitation only. Invitation only. I think it's over in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> if anyone hears me and opens the door, uh, I will come in and eat with him and him with me. Jesus says, I'm here. Matter of fact, there is a painting that was painted back in 1850s by William Hunt. You may have seen it. It's called The Light of the World, and it became a masterpiece. Millions of people have flocked to see this particular painting. <laughs> it's the painting of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and what it might have been like if it had been a, 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 a literal, not figurative. But William Hunt painted Jesus outside of a country cottage, standing there at the door. He has a lantern in his hand. The light of the world is carrying a lantern in his hand. And he's standing before a closed door. And all you can see is him waiting, noticing, listen, there is no knob on the outside of the door. There's only one on the inside, as if to say, he only enters our lives and our hearts and our homes by invitation only. Have you invited him in? <laughs> you might say to me, Lindsay, I've been, I've been a member here longer than you've been living. <laughs> Have you invited him in? Have you opened the door for him? There's some of you that never have. I'm speaking to you too. Today's the day, folks. Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You can't have rest without his peace. You can forget it. You need to say, Lord, I'm opening the door for you today. Today. Come into my home, come into my heart, come into my life today. Verses 6, 7, and 8. See them with me. Let's move, move a little further down. His entry not only makes an impact, not only fulfills prophecy. Watch this with me. When Jesus enters anywhere, he always draws attention. Always. There's crowds following him all, all the time, all over the place. Six, seven, and eight. I'm going to read them again. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Let me just pause for one second. This wasn't only as a saddle, okay? <laughs> this wasn't only as cushion to make Jesus comfortable. No. They placed their cloaks on him. Keep that thought in mind as I read verse 8. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Not only did these people, imagine and picture this, thousands, thousands of people lining the road into Jerusalem. And they're taking off their cloaks. And some are putting it on a, a, a donkey. And some are laying them on the road for the donkey to walk on. This was a red carpet treatment into Jerusalem. This wasn't only so Jesus would be comfortable on this unbroken colt full of a donkey. But it was a way of these people saying to him, you are our king. In the Old Testament, we can read when people peeled off their cloaks and laid them down. It was a way of saying, we are coronating our king. We are throning our king. That's exactly what we see happening here. This is what the people perceived that Jesus would be. One that came in and swept out the Romans. Be our king. Reign Jesus in power. See, that's what the people were thinking. They were misguided in how they understood his coming, you see. Crowds were everywhere. They were shouting, our king is coming in power. And they were doing so with the cloaks on the road. But also they were cutting branches, right? Now Matthew doesn't say palm branches, but John's gospel says palm branches, okay? And palm branches, palm branches back then, the palm was a symbol of the national state of Judaism, the Jews. 
They used to even have it imprinted on some coins. This would be like us waving the American flag. This would be like us singing the national anthem. You see, these people were misguided in their understanding of the king that was coming. He was coming gentle, riding on a donkey, coming in peace. And they wanted him to come in power, you see. Come in power. That's why when Stan stood here and told us that not too much longer down the road, the same people who were singing Hosanna would say crucify him. Because he came a different way than what they perceived. He always draws a crowd. The problem comes in churches today, and I'm not beating up churches. I just want you to hear where we are not going. The problem comes in churches today when you do anything you can to draw a crowd. I had a man tell me just three weeks ago, local guy. He said, when I was in Florida, I was a preacher of a big church, he said. And we'd do anything we could to draw a crowd. I said, well, okay, tell me about it. He said, we had an auditorium that seated 2,000 people. And one Sunday, I surprised the people by having those who owned Harley Davidsons ride them up, ride them up the middle aisle. Brum, 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 he said. And they all came up on stage. <laughs> and there was rumbling in the auditorium. And he said, not only that, then I had the, the what are those things called? Curtains. <laughs> I had the curtains peel back to a roadster. Vroom, vroom, revved up. And he said, we were trying to get the motorcycle crowd to come in. I said, really? I, I would never have guessed it. <laughs> I asked Stan. He said, no motorcycles in here. So, we're good. <laughs> Folks, listen to me. I love drawing a crowd if it's with the deity who's on a donkey. I love drawing a crowd not with gimmicks but with the word of God preached in a way that people can say that applies to me. It applies to me. I sat down here and used about four or five tissues <laughs> when we were singing songs this morning. I'm not going to tell you which one because it doesn't matter. But I was moved, you see. Because I know in my heart that I'm not worthy to stand here before you. But when God calls you to do something, <laughs> you just do it. Last week, I came down, I stood down here in front of everybody. I said, I'll see you next week. Do you remember that? I'll be here next week. Do you remember me saying that? <laughs> and also, I want to see you all too. I've been thinking about that all week long. I can't wait to come in here on Sunday morning. I can't wait to be here. Matter of fact, if you go on vacation and you miss a Sunday here, I want you miserable on vacation wondering what we're doing here. Amen. Now that's a straight up truth. I mean that from all my heart. I can't wait to come in. I started Sunday afternoon working on this sermon. When he tells me sometimes, let you work too much, I can't help it. I'm so excited about when Jesus enters a place, he'll stir you. And it's fulfillment of prophecy. And it draws attention. It draws people. Because I know in any crowd, there's someone who's never given their life to Jesus Christ. And I just love to be around when God does something in that person's heart, just watches when God works. I love that. Let's move on to our last point. And that's this. His entry is, inspires praise, folks. It inspires our praise. I love these verses. And again, it's quoting here from the Old Testament. But I love these verses. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, son of David. You realize son of David is a messianic title? They were saying, this is our Messiah. And they were right, but they saw him in a wrong way. Hosanna, son of David. Blessed and he comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna means save. Save us now. That's what these people were shouting. Save us now, Lord. Save us now. Don't wait. Save us now. I want you saying in your own heart, save my family now. I got grandchildren, folks. <laughs> I married when I was three, but I got grandchildren. <laughs> I got four grandchildren. 
And when you not talk about it from time to time, what is the world going to be like when they're teenagers? It's moving so fast, I can't keep up. We need to pray for our family. We need to pray for our littlest ones. We need to provide some space and some place for them when they come to visit. That we share Jesus Christ with them. So as the little ones grow older, they'll remember what they're taught when they were young. Hosanna, save us. Son of David, save us. And then we get back to what we started with. Verse 10, the all-important question. I didn't read it before. Verse 10, who is this? It's the only thing that really makes any difference. It's the all-important question. Verse 10, who is this? This is the one question every one of us needs to have the right answer to. Am I, am I saying it right? You've got to have the right answer to this one. If you don't have the right answer to this question, all the other answers that you have, meaningless. Meaningless in comparison. Who is this? It's called Jesus Christ. He is my Savior, my Lord. He is my Messiah. <laughs> in just a moment or two, Wendy and I are going to come forward at invitation time. No, there's nothing about me that you don't know or are afraid to say, he's not a Christian yet? No. Listen. We're going to place our membership here. Cherry Avenue Christian Church. Haven't done that in years. And I want, to, I want you to hear what it sounds like when a couple says, Jesus Christ leads the way in our home and we are committed here. <laughs> we are committed here. Who is this? Who is this? This is the all-important question because I want you to know something. If you don't already know it, I want you to realize that Jesus came as a babe. He entered Jerusalem as a man. And I'm telling you, he is coming again one day. He's coming again one day. <laughs> He's going to enter again one day into this world. Not as a crucified king, folks, but as one crowned not as one in peace so much, but as one in power. He's not going to come as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's going to come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is coming again. We need to have the right answer to this question, who is this? I'm telling you, when he comes again, it's going to be quickly, it's going to be surely, and it's going to be undeniably, and it's going to be instantaneously. I'm going to read you some verses out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You've heard these verses before. I'm going to start with verses 13 and move down through verse 20-ish. Paul is writing, listen to this. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not proceed those who have fallen asleep. Now listen carefully if you haven't been listening before. Because this is verses 16, 17, and 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. One day these clouds are going to rip apart. With a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, can you imagine still being alive when this happens? We who are still alive and, uh, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever and forever and forever. He's coming again. <laughs> That's a promise. Question is, do you know the answer to the who is this question? Okay. You remember the Tonight Show years ago? That's dating you if you do. Johnny Carson, <laughs> the king of the Tonight Show. This is for Jay Leno and for Jimmy Kimmel and for uh, Saturday Night Live and that kind of stuff. But Johnny Carson used to bring guests on and he would seat them and then he would banter back and forth with them, have jokes over about what they do and he'd have conversations with them, right? Well, one night, Billy Graham was the featured guest. And Johnny was there doing what Johnny does, talking to Billy, bantering back and forth, making jokes at Billy's expense. And at one point in the conversation, Johnny looked over at Billy <laughs> and he said, Billy, I, I, I guess if Jesus returns the next time, we'll just do him in the way we did the first time. 
Everything got sent. Because Billy Graham inched forward in his chair and he stared Johnny right in the eyes. In all seriousness, he said, no. No, Johnny. The first time he came as a lamb, the next time he's going to come as a lion, and no one will be able to do him in. Ever. again. He's coming again, isn't he? He's coming again. Answer me. He's coming in, isn't he? Yes, he is. <laughs> we know not when that time will be. It can be any moment. You need to be ready when that time comes. How quickly things change. On Sunday, people were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And just a few days later, it was crucify him, crucify him. But the thing is, Jesus came into it all with eyes wide open. He knew their praises would fade. He knew what was before him, and he still did it. As scripture says, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When he loves us that much, how could we keep from thanking him and worshiping him for what he did for us on the cross? That's what communion is. We stop everything and we take the bread and the cup that he gave us to remind us of his body and blood that he sacrificed for us. And we remember and we praise him and we thank him for loving us so much. Scripture says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take it. Lord, we know there are times when we turn away from you just as fast as the people in Jerusalem did. And we pray for your forgiveness when we do that. But we're so grateful for your incredible love, love so powerful it washed away our sin. And we pray that you would help us to be faithful, but also that we would share that love with those you put in our life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you'll be able to join us in person for our Good Friday service and especially for our special Easter service next Sunday as we celebrate the event that changed everything, the resurrection of Christ. Have a great week. God bless.